But there's no evidence that evolution... In fact, I think we've kind of given up on the idea of evolution. <laughs> the theory of evolution as articulated by Darwin is like kind of not true. Right? And the degree of confidence yeah. with which he outs this ignorant uh, bullshit really requires some mental discipline to, to reject all of the evidence that's bothering me a lot lately because there are very strong claims being put out. There's a Netflix special on it making claims, for example, that the gut microbiome is involved in things like autism, depression, anxiety, PTSD, whatever, I mean, any, anything you can think of, there must be something going on, but it's all, as far as I can tell, and I haven't seen any convincing thing whatsoever. We could search depression and microbiome and we could pull up the top sided 10 papers. Yeah. Uh, I guarantee you all of them would have those kind of methodological problems. With practice, say this mind training thing, cognition will improve on other tasks. And it turns out that there just isn't any good evidence for that. It's weird to me that the debate in free will just, everyone just look, like assumes uh, determinism is true and then works from there when it's weird, like physics just doesn't say that. Dr. Kevin Mitchell, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, Dr. Mitchell is a neurogenetics professor at Trinity College Dublin, where I studied. I was lucky enough to, to be one of your students for a short time uh, during COVID. Um, it was a neurogenetics module. It was fascinating. I would love to have done it in person. Yeah. Lots of really interesting topics covered. Um, the neurogenetics of developmental disorders. Um, things like synesthesia, which I've always been very interested in. I am, you're just a very interesting all-around guy. So I have loads of different topics that I want to dive into. Great. Things that are tackling the, the future of genetic manipulation. You know, things that you might not have had to talk about for a while. I want to get mm -hmm. your opinions on mm -hmm. AI, on Neuralink, on all of these different things. I am, but let's start by watching this clip. And let me know if this comes well, up for about you. About our okay. ability to make choices at all. Well, my... You, you you can see you can see this man. I'm sure I know you're familiar with this man at this point. Let's let's watch this clip, and I'm I'm excited to get your reaction. My personal way out in left field inflammatory stance is I don't think we have a shred of free will, um, despite you know ninety five percent of philosophers and I think probably the majority of neuroscientists saying that we have free will in at least some circumstances. I don't think there's any at all. Um, and the reason for this. So that was quite an absolutist statement from um, Dr. Sapolsky. And I've read, I've read his book, Behave. I think he's a phenomenal researcher. And the reason why this was a bit shocking to me is that it's, it, it's very black and white. He's making a very strict absolutist claim here. Yeah. And in the first chapter of this book, he really talks about how important nuance is, which is why I was surprised, because there's no nuance in that sentence, right? We don't have a shred of free will. Um, you've obviously written a book called Free Agents, um, How Evolution Gave Us Free Will. I'm reading at the moment, and it's, it's very fascinating. It's really, really interesting. It's a great book. You obviously have a sort of a counter argument to that. So I'm kind of curious on why you think Sapolsky thinks this and why you think any differently. Maybe we'll start off there. Yeah. Yeah, um, I guess I can't speak to why Robert thinks uh, the way that he does. I mean, uh -huh. he makes he makes an argument. I, I I I understand the argument, but I can also see where he makes some leaps in the argument, and also he brings a certain kind of a premise, philosophically speaking. He brings a philosophy to looking at the same evidence that I look at, right? I mean, what's interesting is that is that two neuroscientists can look at the same sort of body of of evidence, basically all of neuroscience, and come to very different conclusions. So on the first on that on that bid, the premise that he starts with, and I think he probably would argue that he doesn't, uh, but but I think he does, is really a dualist one. So so which he which he lampoons. He, so, so he sets up this idea of free will where you are somehow in charge of things, but you're it, but it's not your you're not using your brain to do it. It's this disembodied self, right? And he sets that up as, an, as a ridiculous idea, which in a sense it is, right? It's, it's a supernatural kind of framing. But then he goes on to say, you know, to argue that any, any sort of explanation that's involving your brain in the mechanisms of decision-making isn't you doing it. And so he, he adopts the very sort of stance that he ridicules, and, and and so you'll never get to a kind of a free will that he that would satisfy him if he's looking for this dualist kind of magical thing. I think. 
Um, and and he so. I mean, both of us would agree that there's lots of influences on our behavior, right? Yeah. So past human evolution, our own genetics. I mean, that's what that course that you took with me yeah. was all about, right? It's, yeah. what my, it's what my prior book, Innate, was all about, yeah. was genetic influences on our personalities and predispositions and so on. Um, and then, of course, we learn from our experiences. Now, what he says is that all of those things together, all of those influences completely rule out any scope for you to be involved in making a decision, right? They they collectively configure your brain in such a way that in any scenario, in any scenario that you could ever encounter, there will always be only one thing that will happen because of the computations in your brain, right? Which I, I think is just, uh, well, first of all, there's no evidence for that, right? There's no evidence for the ex the main claim of his book. He just provides no evidence for it. He provides loads of evidence for the other bits which make it seem, they all make it seem like, oh, there's this huge effect of genes and these huge effects of past uh, environment and, and, and so on. And I think he hopes that the, the, the weight of those impressions will lead people to just believe yeah. that collectively those things leave no room for you to do anything. And, you know, I just disagree. All of those influences are, in fact, exactly the thing that allow you to do something, that know that, that allow you to know what to do, that allow you to be yourself through time or to be an entity through time. I mean, evolution has packed us full of pre-configured control policies and motivations and drives that keep us alive. And our genetics has, has you know, given us some individual variation on that general human nature. And then all of our experiences are the things we've learned from, right? All our memories, um, all our, our all our ongoing projects and goals, um, all the habits and things that we've developed, are exactly what we bring to decision making. Right? It's that it's that history that makes us who we are. But it doesn't preclude options. It generates options. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's that it, it's it's because we can think about things. Because we can think, oh, you know, well, I, I see this person and I remember them, but, you know, I'm in this scenario and there's a few things I could do. And the last time I, I did this, it didn't work out well. And uh, on the other hand, there's, there's, you know, there's a threat over here and an opportunity over here. That, that's what we need cognition for. Yeah. And yeah. there's nothing about it that's, that's pre-statable, okay. that's predetermined. Pre it's really genuinely open. So how do you... How do you, or what's your strongest argument against this sort of physical determinism that I think is at the heart of, of this argument of free will? Yeah. That, you know, all of our thinking modules and cognitive modules that, that give us the ability to think, you can kind of keep going and slicing the layers and going down and down and down. And you, yeah. you know, you've neural circuits, then you've neurons, then you go all the way down to subatomic particles. And in the end, all of that is inherently deterministic and you know, we're not, we only have like an illusion of free will because, you know, the information is abstracted on so many different layers. Yeah. Um, you know, which part of that do you think, where does the free will emerge? You know, if oh. we are underlying, um, you know, subatomic particles fighting yeah. against thermodynamics, you yes. know, where does the determinism fall down? Where, do, where does the free will, where does the agency come from? Yeah, the determinism falls down at the very first step. It just physics just doesn't make that claim. Right. So, I mean, well, people, physicists may make that claim, uh, but first of all, at, at the quantum level, we know it's fundamentally indeterministic, right? We know, for example, um, well, let me back up. The, the idea of determinism would be that the state of the universe at any given moment, exhaustively defined, plus the laws of physics, completely determine the next future state of the whole universe, right? Or any closed system. And... There's just something inevitable about that. And it, and of course, that it also determines the next state and the next and the next and the next forever, right? So there's just one sacred timeline that can't be deviated from. And there are no real choices in that kind of scenario. And everything I'm saying right now and everything you're saying was determined at the moment of the Big Bang. And that information was somehow actually physically encoded in the structure of the universe at the Big Bang, right? So that's a ridiculous and absurd assertion. And physics doesn't actually uh, support that. So, so first of all, at the, yeah, at the quantum level, you can't define the state of a system exhaustively at any moment. 
because of things like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, which just says that the there's particles or fields or whatever just don't have defined pairs of, of values of things like position and momentum, right? The more precisely one is defined, the less precisely the other one is defined. That's just a mathematical relationship between them. Um, and also because of the way things progress in quantum systems, um, you know, the Schrodinger equation, which describes how quantum fields will evolve is very deterministic, but it is only determining probabilities. And once something actually happens, once there's some kind of interaction that forces a collapse of the system um, or a resolution of those probabilities into one actuality, then the, that's actually random, as far as we can tell. Right? And then so people will say, OK, well, that's all quantum stuff. Right. But when things get big, like us, like classical systems, well, we know that's deterministic. It averages right? out, becomes. Yeah. yeah, that's the idea. But in fact, uh, there's no evidence that classical physics is deterministic either. It's just an assumption mm -hmm. of physics. It's not a result of physics. And you can say, so there's an argument that um, for classical physics to be deterministic, so for some future, t future state to be completely determined, the equations are, are, don't have randomness in, in them, but the initial conditions that you're starting with can't be exhaustively defined, mm -hmm. right? They can't be defined with infinite precision uh, because it would take infinite space in order to do that. Yeah. And so if there's some, if there's some little bit of indefiniteness in the parameters of the system right now, then, you know, that that's not going to make much difference at the next time step or the next or the next, but now it's going to start to make a little difference. And so, it, it depends on what kind of system you're looking at. So if you're looking at the orbits of the planets where Newton started, yeah, it doesn't. They're really linear, right? So a little bit of imprecision here equals just a little bit of imprecision a thousand years from now, right? Right. But if you're studying complex systems that have lots of dynamic interacting feedback loops, yeah, then a little bit of imprecision now gets magnified to make it. For example, uh, say we're studying the weather, we can predict. An, an hour from now, okay. <laughs> not so much in Ireland, right? Yeah, it depends where you are. In Spain, yeah. in Spain it's pretty care pretty good, but in my Ireland, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, you know, we're not so good a week from now, and we're we, and we have zero power a, a year from now, right? I can't tell you what the weather's going to be like, and it's not just that we don't know; it's that there's no answer to that question yet. So. So it's weird to me that the debate in free will just everyone just look, like assumes. Uh, determinism is true and then works from there when it's weird like physics just doesn't say that and and do you think that that imprecision that intrinsic randomness is the essential aspect that actually gives us the free will you know so like like the fact that there is on a on a as small a level as you go down to some atomic particles that it's non-deterministic and that it is random there's a, a probability distribution of events that could uh, could occur that the the um you know the system co could evolve in a distribution of different ways is that also the way behavior works where if i'm in a bar and i'm looking across and there is an attractive girl that i want to talk to there's a distribution of events that could occur some events are completely outside the scope of what could happen and some are inside. So, you know, we don't either have complete free will or free will doesn't exist. There is bounded constraints on our free will based on our perceptions, based on our genetics, based on all of the other factors. And that's maybe all the way down to the level of atomic particles because of that inherent randomness. Do, do you think that yeah. that's appropriate? Well, so it's not quite, because I think when we do, like your description of the sort of bounded rationality, uh, the decision making, is I think quite right, um, but I don't think it directly hinges on these random events down at subatomic particles. So um, there's a kind of a, a common rejoinder when people will say, look, either physics is deterministic at the low levels, in which case you don't decide anything, or physics is random at the low levels, and because you're not controlling the randomness, you don't decide anything. Now, both of those views are taking all of the but they're seeing all of the causation in the system as at the lowest levels, right? So they're both very reductive views. And there's, it's a kind of an eliminative view. It's like all the causation is exhausted down at the lowest levels, even if some of the things are not predetermined, 
the way they play out is still going to manifest in the way your brain is configured and eventually your behavior. So the, the, the key thing, and this is the, really the key part of the argument um, that I make in the book and that many other people have made as well, is that the there's some, it's not that there's random events happening at the low levels, but it's the fact that there's some noise, right? There's some looseness to the system. So it's just not the case that what's happening at the lowest levels necessarily determines the next state. And what that means is that the way that the system is organized can do some work, right? There's some scope, there's some causal slack in the system that means organizing the system a certain way can constrain the possibility space, right? So you've got some bunch of, of atoms, they're bouncing around and they're doing some random jitters and so on, but you can constrain them to, uh, you know, to go down one sort of path or another, right? And I mean, we just see that in the physical world all the time. We see it in the devices that we're using right now. They're, they're designed to constrain the, say, the movements of electrons, right? And in a way that doesn't, uh, it's not messing with the randomness. It's not reaching down and poking quantum stuff. It's not, um, it's not violating the laws of physics or adding any, any sort of magical stuff. It's just setting the possibility space. And, but the important thing is that in our design machines, it's doing that for a function, right? The functionality to it. Um, so it's organized the way it is for a reason. And it, it, um, it allows functions to be executed, basically. And so what I would say is that living systems take advantage of the, exactly the same thing. There's some slack at the lower levels, and to be a living system is just to be a, a you know, a system at the, for the simplest things of just chemical reactions that are organized in such a way as to keep themselves going and resist the second law of thermodynamics. So it, you know, the study of biology just is the study of organization through time and persist through time. So, um, so what that means is that the indeterminacy, some indefiniteness um, at the lowest physical level is not sufficient to give us free will or, or control, but it's a requirement, right? If we didn't have that, we wouldn't, there'd be nothing to talk about. There'd be no choices. There'd be no complex systems would ever evolve, in fact, uh, in my view. And so instead, what you can think of is, okay, you, now you, you get systems that evolve, They've got some noisy stuff going on inside them, but they have enough organizational sort of regime of constraints to um, keep the whole system going in the way that they want it to go. And so you can think about that just in terms of homeostasis, you know, just the thing keeping itself alive and keeping all its parameters within the set points that it likes. Um, but you can expand the idea to systems of behavioral control. Yeah. Yeah, no, th th this makes sense to me. This is why I was I was very shocked at him saying that he doesn't believe we have a shred of free will. You know, like I would suspect the answer is somewhere in the middle, like it usually is with science. It's nuanced and it's complicated. Sure. I'm curious on your perspective on, is this even ever falsifiable? Will we ever conduct an experiment and then a paper is released and say, here it is, you know, free will, we have this much free will and we've quantified it with this. Like, is it ever actually possible to even get an answer to this? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think it's funny because um, someone asked me this yesterday. They were saying, how could you prove free will? And, yeah. and you know, I said, well, why Why do you think the burden of proof is on me? I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm making you a claim. Do it now. Why haven't you done it already? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm making a claim that's perfectly congruent with all of our experience, yeah. right? The phenomenology of our lives that we go around, we're making decisions, we're thinking yeah. about what to do, we're acting for our reasons. Um, and we can tell people those reasons and so on. So the, for, for me, it's the people who are claiming we are the proof should be on the other side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The burden yeah. should be on them, but, but, and there are many experiments that people could point to where they say, look, in this case, well, actually they don't say in this case, they just say, look, you didn't, you know, you weren't aware of the decision or you weren't in control of your behavior or, um, you don't, you don't know why you made a decision. A thought just popped into your mind. And of course, there are scenarios like that, right? There are scenarios where you don't know why you did something, where you didn't have a good reason and it seemed, you know, maybe it was a bit random, uh, whether, you know, you took the, the, the left road or the right road to work and it doesn't make much difference, right? They're the same length and you're like, yeah, I don't care. Um, 
that doesn't mean that every decision is like that. Right? So just because you can point to some decisions that are habitual or automatic or where we're not really thinking about things, we don't know why we did something, doesn't mean we never make deliberative decisions. So um, I think there's been a lot of that kind of extrapolation in the literature, especially the discussions around th that seem to come from neuroscience experiments or social psychology experiments or things like that, that just isn't warranted, right? Because we're not talking about, um, we're not talking about a scenario that's absolutist and defined in some logical mathematical terms where one exception falsifies the claim. It's perfectly possible in biology to say, well, sometimes it's like this and sometimes it's like that. And and so it's a weird, I get frustrated by some of those over extrapolations um, by people who should just know better than that in my mind. Yeah. It's a bit clickbaity and it's a bit, you know, in my sense, what I got, I'm always a little bit suspect now of, of scientists who are on podcasts because they're trying to get 30 second sort of clickbait you know clips that are going to go around on, on social media and you know that's how they can get a lot of coverage and fame now and science is just not meant to be condensed to 30 seconds because you're, you're almost always going to be able to find issues in what they say it's always going to be either dampened down there's nuance lost it's a bit sensationalist you know mm -hmm. it's just science is sort of meant for long form and the you know the compression of our of our uh, how we consume media is kind of causing a lot of this misinformation i think and we'll definitely go into into misinformation um actually we'll do that now i think i um, so what do you think because i'm fascinated by um myths and the neuro myths that are very popular and that people still believe yeah. what do you think is are some of the most common myths that people hold about the brain um, yeah. You know, the average listener today has a mental model of, of their own brain, of all brains, of how brains work. Yeah. What is one or two things that they hold about their brain that are most likely to just be completely false? Well, yeah. Um, I mean, there's some classic ones, like the idea that we only use 10% of our brain. Right. It's just a, like it's, it's hard for a neuroscientist to even know what that claim means. Like, yeah. What do you even talk like? Which no electrical activity in in timber? Yeah, just yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's that one's funny because, um, in fact, uh, neurons are really energetically expensive, right? And and if you look at actually the principles of how brains are put together, they are ruthlessly efficient, right? They're going to they're going to take in uh, as little information as they can. They're going to pass as little uh, information as they need to with as few electrical spikes as, as they can get away with. Um, and so, you know, the idea that you would have some, this expensive, metabolically expensive brain tissue just sitting around not doing anything is, is just absurd. Um, the other aspect I think of that is though, that, you know, when you, say, when you ask the people, what do you do with your brain? They'll say, I think, I think with my brain, right? But they won't say I control my, I control my, um, you know, physiology with my brain. They don't, they don't, you know, we don't often think of it as a physiological control system. They may not even say things like I see with my brain or I, feel, you know, that where, you know, you've got a good, what, two fifths of your brain there is like visual system, right? So um, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on in your brain that you're not aware of that isn't part of, uh, an activity that you would call thinking, that sort of mental, real cogitation, you know, that you can kind of feel yourself doing, talking to yourself in your head. Um, so, so that's another myth, I think, is that the, the idea that brains are for thinking. Um, to my mind, brains are control systems, and the thinking bits are just like a really sophisticated part of that control system. Mm -hmm. Lisa, are you familiar with um, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett? I think she's absolutely yeah. brilliant. I, two of her, I've been obsessed with her, her, um, her scientific work in the last in the last year or so. She wrote two amazing books about how emotions are made. And yeah. she, she very neatly summarizes what the brain does to regulate the body's resources. You yeah, know, so, that's one of the best sh short, because it, again, it's hard to give an, like a short definition of what the brain does. It does so much, but yeah. one of the things that it does is is just to manage the body's resources i yeah. am um, i think that's a very appropriate sort of definition that you can give that's you know most accurate yeah no i think that's right and and so um i haven't read her uh books but i i know her work um i i would i actually sort of uh, quibble with her on the question of whether oh, emotions are 
whether emotions are kind of um, uh, pre-configured uh, in a way or, or always have to develop, you know, in each individual. I think there's a, probably an, an interplay there. Um, but, explain, that, explain that a little bit more. I'm curious. Well, so my understanding with, um, I don't want to speak too much to her claim, but my understanding yeah. of it is that she thinks that these uh, emotions are somehow learned. Um, whereas I would say they're quite basic, fundamental homeostatic signals that evolution pre-configures. Um, and that, of course, we learn what they mean. And we learn when we're having an emotion, how, you know, what we should attribute it to out in the world or in ourselves or, mm -hmm. or so on. Um, and so there's, I just wanted to point out there are, there are some alternate theories to hers on where emotions come from. But I think the general point is, is really good, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, that's another myth, I would say, that emotion and cognition are somehow opposed to each other. Yeah. And we can't do cognition properly without having the emotional signals because what we have to do when we're thinking about what uh to do in the world is we have to weigh we, we have to weigh up different scenarios different potential outcomes different drives and goals that are competing and conflicting within us at any moment and those emotional signals help us do that and if we didn't have them we couldn't uh, we couldn't logic our way through right we have to this is again, you know, behavior is a kind of a form of, of homeostasis. Yeah. If we're out of whack somehow, you know, if, if our fuel is too low, then we have to do something uh, to remedy that. Yeah. So we need to have those signals as part of our cognitive system. On the other hand, of course, we don't want them to just be driving our behavior in a very sort of uh, automatic way that we can't rationally control. And, and I would say, in fact, over evolution and over the maturation of individual human human beings, it's precisely those systems for um, rationally controlling um, our, our action that is what gives us free will. That's what I would call. Yeah. I did want to mention one other one about a, a myth, which is about neural plasticity. Uh -huh. So this was, you know, this was really popular, uh, maybe 15 years ago um all these books about neuroplasticity and how the you know the like things titles like the brain that can change itself and stuff like that they were and they got a um they merged into the self-help realm very, very much so yeah yeah and um it was taking some observations from neuroscience but then really really saying look here's what this means for you in your life and if I'm going to be a little cynical here, but like, if you buy my book and read this thing, then yeah, you'll learn how to course. There's how so to many your your brain, right? courses online now. And I, like, yeah, I, just, I don't know what's in them. I'm not saying they're all complete bullshit, but like, you know, there's, you know, a thousand, no one needs an a thousand euro neuroplastic, neuroplasticity yeah. course. It's just, I don't know what could possibly be in that. <laughs> yeah, I know I don't either. And, and so, um, yeah, those those claims are just really, really overblown. Like parts of the brain can reconfigure a bit. You know, for example, in early people who are blind early on, you know, what would be visual cortex can take on different functions and so on. But even there, there's a limit to it. Um, you know, later on, um, the the sort of claims of being able to ra massively reorganize brain circuits are just uh, there's just no good evidence for those. Really, of course, what does happen is little bit like on a micro circuit level on a synaptic level of course your brain's changing all the time right that's how we learn things that's how we remember things yeah and, um and it, you know the the counter position is not that your brain is fixed and you can't change anything it's you know it's just that you change through learning and and we can change our habits you know if we try hard enough and we can uh adopt new policies and ways of behaving and uh, and so on within some within some limits yeah um, it's often effortful um if we're really going against ingrained you know personality traits or habits but it, that's you know there's no point telling people that there's this magic sort of possibility of just being however any which way yeah you want all, to be. All, all you have to do know that all you have to do is brush your teeth with your left hand and that triggers immense amount of neuroplasticity in the brain and that means you can learn spanish better i don't know <laughs> if, i don't know if you knew that there's is that yeah. a real one? Oh, that's absolutely a real one really? um jim quick is a, i think a, 
a bit an absolute charlatan to be honest but the he says a lot of these things you know he spouts a lot about left brain right brain a lot about multiple intelligence theory yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of these models that don't really have any predictive ability in the real world he's mm -hmm. basically saying you know just do different things every day and that will inherently make your brain more neuroplastic in every way and maybe there's a tiny bit of weight to you know like i'm not saying don't do new things you know i'm a big yeah, advocate yeah. for like um you know learn a new musical instrument these things but it doesn't have magical powers and yeah. he seems to ascribe a huge benefit to left hand to um teeth washing and left hand cup drinking and things like this of just sure. just activating the you know the the other motor hemisphere that you don't use that often well that's a great so it's a great example of one of these things where uh you know if you hear a claim well, some some simple intervention like that that sounds with with tremendous sort of uh, potential supposed impact. Well, it's just not true. I mean, you know, just beware, right? You know, it, it's and there's so many uh, claims out there like that of these very very modest interventions which are supposed to have life changing effect afterwards. And you know, I mean anyone who's been alive and paying attention to the way things go should be suspicious. Of it's obvious. Kind of and it wouldn't even be adaptive for the brain to be able to change that much, right? I mean, you wouldn't want rapid reorganization of the brain because you did something that took 10 minutes. You, exactly. you know, you, like the, the brain needs to be responsive to, okay, you're doing this. You've been say like, I'm, I'm training for a triathlon at the moment and I'm, you know, dedicating 15 hours a week to this. That's something where I'm like, you know, over a year, over a couple of years, that could have an impact on my brain physically because it's an actual, very sizable amount of hours per week, you sure. know? Yeah. But any of these other things where it's just you're expecting a five minute fix to ha have rapid changes in the brain, it wouldn't yeah. even be adaptive for that. That's not, it doesn't even make sense. It wouldn't be useful. It wouldn't be good. Yeah. Like what happens in the next five minutes for the next, like how uh, it, it's just, it's an odd, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's inconsistent with itself, right? It's, it's an incoherent claim uh, that this 10 minutes can have huge effects because the next 10 minutes could undo it, right? If it's that positive. Exactly. And so, but you touch on a really important point because there is a stage at which, uh, you know, humans have this really protracted period of juvenile development where we're learning, we're playing, we're exploring our, while our brains are maturing, while those circuits are being sculpted. And we're, we have this, this ability there, thereby to um, adapt to our own personal experiences through, through some time period, right? So, uh, so our brains really do get shaped in certain ways uh, you know, they get shaped, for example, by the languages that we hear. And so our brains get almost, you know, configured to, for a particular language, so much so that we can't even hear the distinctions between, say, vowel sounds in French or uh, tonal sounds in Mandarin or something like that. Um, and, you know, babies can hear the difference between those, but older people can't. So, so we have this period of becoming. Right where we're we're learning with the world, uh, we're adapting as we go. But then at some point we just have to stop. We just have to be. Right, we have to stop becoming and just be. And um, and that you know matches with very clear changes in neural plasticity. And you know you lose the the wholesale kind of activity dependent remapping that can happen. Um, and you retain just the micro structural synaptic plasticity. But um, yeah, I mean, there's very clear biology underlying that change, uh, of, you know, critical periods and closure of critical periods and so on. Um, and there's also very good ecological life history reasons why you want to stop learning from everything that you encounter and why it's useful to have some, some habits just so you can get through life. Um, yeah. Of yeah. course. What do you think, just to wrap this neuroplasticity conversation in a bow, because I, I think it's really interesting and you're, you're dead right that it has been co-opted by the self-improvement space as a buzzword now to sort of stay nimble, stay flexible and stay young, which I think everybody, everyone wants to do. The answer is just that it's way harder to do um, than these solutions will let you believe. Yeah. What, what are, you know, I'd say beyond sleep, exercise and diet, which I think are the obvious ones for improving neuroplasticity. Do, do you think that there are, is good research behind anything except for that health triad, which does keep your brain more nimble, more flexible, more, you know, just, just young? More well, plastic. so, I mean, the first question is, why would you want it to be more plastic? 
right? I mean, that's a that in itself is a claim that's often made. It's like the the basic premise is more plastic is better, and you know everything I was just saying about that that life history where the plasticity gets tamped down at a certain point argues against that, right? If more plasticity would, was better, we would have more plasticity going, you know, for, for longer. So um, there's a reason why plasticity gets tamped down. And part of it is that we um, develop, a, you know, a crystallized intelligence where basically it means we're learning about the world and we are, uh, we, and we have to, in order to keep that knowledge intact, we can't be just reorganizing stuff all the time. So we have to balance between stored stored knowledge and what eventually becomes practical wisdom for want of a better word, right? It means that you, you know how the world works, you've spent time learning about it, and you can quickly make decisions without having to think from first principles in every scenario that you're, you're in. I mean, that's what, that's the trade-off that you get with age, right? Um, so, so yeah, I don't. Um, that's where I would start is is questioning the premise there that the idea that more plasticity is better. Um, Push back a that. little bit on on yeah. that and why why our evolutionary history might have made us made our brains this way, but why that might not be so adaptive now. You know, it, it's obvious that the world is a lot more dynamic and a lot more fast paced than it ever was before. You know, I would see great benefit to. I want to be learning as efficiently as possible until I'm 150 years old. You know, with modern with modern technology and everything, you know, I, I, yeah, like that's like I'm a big learner. I've always loved learning. I want to be reading books and and learning as much as I can from those books until I'm 150. So let's just take that example of I want to be able to learn the guitar when I'm 80 or pick up Korean when I'm 90 or, you yeah. know, just I want to be able to while having all of the crystallized modalities that make me a well-rounded human um, be able to pick up things and learn things. And if I want to learn computer science when I'm a hundred, um, my brain is in good shape to do that. You know, so that would be my, you know, there's a lot of things we can learn and want to learn as we yeah, yeah, yeah. older now. No, absolutely. And so um, I'm, I'm not challenging that at all. I'm all behind that. And um, I'm just challenging the framing of it in the language of neuroplasticity, right? So, if, uh, and I, you know, beyond exercise and diet and sleep, the, the, the other thing that I would add to that is learning, right? So do keep learning, right? If you want to be learning, make a habit of it. And, um, you know, I think you can talk about those things at a psychological level in terms of, uh, and, and a personal level in terms of the kinds of practices that will, um, yeah, keep you thinking about things and, and so on, that where there's a value to that, that doesn't have to be couched in this, language of neuroplasticity that you know is is only sort of arguably apt or appropriate for the kinds of things that we're we're talking we don't really know and the so the the one thing i would say is that i don't think um the, so so one of the challenges in this field is this question of transfer or or generalizability so for example if you do if you do sudokus uh you know once a day does that mean that you'll be better able to learn something else? And that's a claim that uh, is often made with some of these pop psychology interventions. Oh, sorry, I, said, I shouldn't say pop psych. Well, they are a bit. Um, yeah, okay. So, so the idea that if you practice, say, this mind training thing, that you your cognition will improve on other tasks. And it turns out that there just isn't any good evidence for that. What happens when you practice the mind training thing or the Sudokus or whatever is you get better at the mind training game or the Sudoku. Which is really sad, right? I wish it wasn't like that. I think everyone wish it yeah. wasn't like that. But not that you could you could become better at something completely unrelated to Sudokus right. by doing Sudokus. But there is always this nice idea that, you know, by challenging yourself and learning, there's some generalizability, right? You well, mean yeah, I mean, I, I maybe, you know, I would say that maybe maintaining an open mind and a, and a level of curiosity is just a habit, right? It's just a habit of thought that can be cultivated. And again, I would be very happy to um, endorse that kind of view in, in psychological terms, right? I just, again, don't see the added benefit of adding neuro in front of any of the terms that we're using to discuss. But it sounds more scientific, so it clearly has more efficacy if it has the neuro word. Clearly. That's exactly right. You know, I mean, that's, 
Uh, and if you can add a picture of a brain scan, well, oh, so yeah. much better. That's super science. With an arrow to a particular region with a no, thing, it's it's uh, just, just a people. random area. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That all adds to the efficacy of the technique. Yeah, there's a, there's a, um, yeah, there's extra truthiness when you can put a brain scan picture. I mean, there's, there's evidence showing that, right? That people find the same story uh, with, uh, with or without uh, you know, like an arbitrary brain picture they find the one with the picture more convincing sounding and you know i mean that's reasonable people looking at that who aren't trained in the field uh, can't evaluate whether it makes sense or not but it looks more concrete than just a description in words of you know these habits of keeping an open mind for example it, there's a, a sense in which that's a bit wishy-washy uh, but i don't think that's fair i mean i, I you know psychology is a uh, is a, is a whole science unto itself. It doesn't need neuroscience to make it more uh, valid. Yeah, um, yeah. But the um, the reason I wanted to keep talking about the neuroplasticity one is because it's such a hot topic at the moment. And I was watching a podcast a few months ago with. Are you, are you familiar with the Diary of the CEO podcast with with, with Stephen Bartlett? He's a UK entrepreneur, but he's the podcast is basically the biggest podcast in the world at the moment, mm. and. His most popular podcast is with this woman called Dr. Tara Swart. I've made a few reaction clips to her claims that she was making on this podcast because okay. they're utter bollocks. They're just shite. And I use my language. They're just they're completely crazy. Um, there, there's about six claims she made that I found just verifiable evidence that they're it, not just that she wasn't saying the truth, but it was the exact opposite. Okay. And one of the claims that she made was that. There's two things that we can do to improve neuroplasticity in the brain, two of the most important. And one of them is aerobic exercise. Fine. Great. That's, yeah, I'd say that's number one. The second one is eating dark-skinned fruits. <laughs> and, and, I, and I just immediately paused the video and was like, did, she, did, I just, did I just hallucinate? Did she just say that the oversleep or diet or having social, social friends or even just learning itself she said that eating dark-skinned fruits is the second, and I was like, okay, do some research into this. Dark-skinned fruits have a dark pigment called anthocyanins. They contain antioxidants. Okay, I see where the chain of logic is coming from. But no, there's absolutely no evidence for this, and um, you know, antioxidants are much more important in older individuals because they've built up metabolic stress. It clears up reactive oxygen species, you know, but this is obviously nuance that she completely left out. She yeah. said to a general audience, the second most important thing you can do out of any activity in the world is to eat dark skin fruits. And this podcast has 11 million views. 11 it's the most viewed podcast on yeah. his whole channel. And he's probably the biggest podcast in the world. I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is crazy. This yeah. is insane misinformation. It doesn't even sound correct. It doesn't even sound accurate. The podcast the, host. Yeah, the thing that, that, that just, like any normal person listening to that, the, a normal reaction would be, the hell are you talking about? How could that possibly be true? Yeah, it's like, it just it doesn't even sound believable. Okay, um, let's, let's go to another clip that um, I think was even more unbelievable and I was going to, I found this on your um, X timeline, which is a very enjoyable place to spend some time. And um, I couldn't believe what I was watching and I was going to react to it. But I said, I'm going to talk to a, you know, a tenured neurogeneticist. He's going to have a better reaction to this than I am. Let me see if this plays now. But if, if, if evolution is real and if there is this is constant, <laughs> I don't know. But it's it's it's. Visible. I apologize. Like I you can measure it in certain animals. You, you can, can measure adaptation. Yeah, but there's no evidence that evolution. In fact, I think we've kind of given up on the idea of evolution. <laughs> the theory of evolution, as articulated by Darwin, is like kind of not true. Right? In what in what sense? Well, in the most basic sense, the idea that you know all life emerged from a single cell organism and over time, and there would be a fossil record of that, and there's not. And There's not a fossil record of uh, transitionary species, like species that are adapting to its environment. There's and tons develop. of record of right. adaptation, and you see it in your own life. I mean, I have a lot of dogs. I, I see adaptation in dogs, you know, through the sure. um, litter to litter. But no, there's no <laughs> evidence at all that, none, zero, that, zero. you know, zero. people you know, evolve seamlessly from a single cell amoeba. No, there's not. There's not. There's no chain in the fossil record of that at all. And that's why you don't actually hear people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's super painful, right? And you It's know, so it, painful. 
the thing is like it's totally this tired creationist argument he does um, go on to give a, the next 45 seconds that I had to be like look we're done with this is him saying that his own theory is that he is a creationist and that god created humans and that's, yeah, that's like it, which uh, it's clearly not his theory in the first place <laughs> yeah um, but it's yes, also exactly. not his theory right it's just a it's just a cop out um yeah no it's bizarre they you know the degree of confidence yeah. with which he uh, yeah. spouts this ignorant uh, bullshit is yes. really impressive, I have to say. It and, is. Um, even you could see, even Joe Rogan it has this sort of, sort of confused look on his face, like, "What do you?" Really? No, the, like, how can you be saying? That? I saw a great diagram, which was the Zealot's Corner on yes. the, on the same post, which was like a hundred percent conviction, zero percent knowledge. Exactly. exactly. You know, and it's like, and that, and that again, that podcast has like eight million views in yeah. twenty four hours. You I know, think what would be really interesting would be to ask. Uh, what evidence could possibly convince him, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you started a conversation like that with him, I, I think you would rapidly find that he would say no evidence would convince him. Because, yeah. for example, uh, there is, a, of course, a fossil record. There yes. is even a fossil record of things like particular kinds of bacteria uh, and so on. So, um, and, you know, but also the whole fossil thing is like, this is a hundred years ago argument. I mean, yeah. we have DNA, like the DNA yeah, record. Yeah. In fact, like, the molecular genetics didn't come up. I was like, it's bizarre because yeah. you know, if you, a, if you do, a, if you want to know if you're related to somebody, right? So you know, you do a paternity test or something like that, or you go on Twenty Three and Me and you find some relatives and cousins and so on. Um, well, that's evidence that you came from the, a common ancestor, right? Yeah. So if you find a third cousin on 23andMe, then you had a common ancestor and the genetics very clearly shows that and no one would argue with it, right? Yeah. Well, you can do the same thing over millennia and you can yeah. do it over species. So if you do it with humans and chimps and elephants, uh, you will find that humans and chimps are clo more closely related to each other than they are to elephants. Yeah. And you can keep going and you get a perfectly consistent picture that's entirely consistent with the fossil record, uh, which shows that, you know, all of life operates on the same biochemical principles and has shared genes and a history of shared um, ancestry that, uh, yeah, well, I, you know, can't expect Joe Rogan to push back yeah. uh, with that kind of evidence, but it's so, it's just that, that's why I call it, you know, said it's such a tired argument. You could have, you know, he could have been saying that in the 1950s Yeah, and people were, with just as much confidence and with just as little evidence, you know, no evidence. So um, it's kind of funny that, that, you know, we're still having this argument. And of course, in, you know, in the U S in particular, the evolution one is, is um, religiously motivated. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Is that why you think that in the U S specifically that around the Bible belt area of the U S they're going to, you know, they're just using their confirmation bias to, to ignore yeah. all the evidence for evolution, which is, so obviously there, especially with molecular genetics and DNA, yeah, to say that the creationist perspective. Yeah, it really, really requires some it's mental insane. discipline yeah. to, to reject all of the evidence uh, yeah. that's yeah. involved. Because you have to reject geology and you have to reject the physics of things like carbon dating and you know but but I mean it's not just in the US, of course, there's lots of places where that are that are quite creationist, uh, Northern Ireland being one of them actually. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but it's just a, it's a it's a weird thing, and it's a the particular clip that you showed that though illustrates a trend these days where people are very willing to make claims that are just willfully ignorant. Yeah, uh, with enormous confidence. Enormous like, confidence. This idea yeah. like we don't we're tired of experts. Uh, we don't it's need. Uh, we. The thing that annoyed me about that clip is like we've stopped believing in Darwin's theory of evolution. I'm like, who's we? Don't involve me in this. I hope not. I'm not, or, you know, we're not involved in this. We, he's saying we, like he has this unanimous group of people behind him and they're all making this argument together. It's like, I don't know who we is in this circumstance, but we. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, to think of the audience for that. Um, how many people who don't have, you know, and we, we've got a biological uh, education, right? So we can judge that. But how many people listening to that exactly don't have that education who may not have had strong opinions about it, but they'll exactly. hear him. They'll hear him saying that we have moved on from Darwin or whatever, um, as if as if he's talking about the scientific consensus. Right? Yes, exactly. So it's a rhetorical move 
that unfortunately can be really effective. Yes, exactly. That's why I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a big free speech proponent. I am, you know, I believe that Tucker Carlson has the right to go on a podcast and say that. But sure. that's why I think it's our our duty and responsibility to react to it and say that this man doesn't know a shred about evolution or science or genetics or a thing, you know, and, and this video will certainly not get 7.5 million views. No. But, you know, if there are a couple of hundred people see this and think Tucker Carlson doesn't know, doesn't know shit about this topic, then that's at least our duty here. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what I think? Um, I, so I completely agree. And I think, uh, you know, many scientists, when they're thinking about, you know, public outreach and science communication and so on, um, will think, okay, I, say, I have a thing to say and I'm going to say it. And they say it and then they think, right, I did it. Yeah. Uh, but what they don't realize is that there's, there's people on the other side just don't stop, right? Yeah. They're just going to keep saying, he's going to say the same thing tomorrow. He's going to yeah. say the same thing next week and he's just go on and on and on and on. So, um, yeah, it, it, I agree with you. It does require um, some persistent engagement on the, you know, to, to, to yes. get messages on the other side that, are, that, that, that just constantly debunk those kinds of claims and, yeah. that, and that at the same time provide a positive counter narrative that people can understand, right? Because yeah. so, that's the challenge, right? You know, is to, is to, you've got on the one hand, complex, nuanced, subtle messages of provisional understanding uh, yeah. Where people are still arguing about little little details, and on the other hand, you've got one sure single truth, nice yeah. and simple: we were created by God. Um, so, you know, in terms of what, it, it's not too surprising that that some people will lean towards the simple wrong answer, um, just because it's psychologically less taxing. I am. Yeah, sorry. I was just saying, let's let's dive to the microbiome next, if you would, because this is a super interesting area of research. I remember it being in Trinity and this being a very interesting area of research where things like fecal supplements were coming up and there were a lot of connections between, I think it was mostly depression and the my microbiome ecosystem at that time. Um, where are, what are some common myths related to our microbiome and some common things that are being put out there at the moment that you don't think there's sufficient evidence for? This is a... Yeah, this is an area that's, that's bothering me a lot lately uh, because there are very strong claims being put out, um, including, I mean, there's a, there's a Netflix special on it, uh, you know, right now, making claims, for example, that the gut microbiome is involved in things like autism, depression, anxiety, PTSD, whatever, I mean, any, anything you can think of um, in terms of psychiatric conditions or um, states. So... And I have no problem with the idea that the microbiome is really involved in our digestion, digestive system and bowel conditions and, and so on, right? And I don't even have a problem with the idea that having some bowel dis disturbances may cause some behavioral or mood disturbances, right? Um, but there's, there, there's much, much stronger claims being made that uh, differences in the microbiome are causally linked to things like autism. So if we take that as an example, um, you can look at the type of study that's been done and honestly it's i literally use these 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 sorts of methodologies in my lectures on bad methodology <laughs> and, and so, so it's a good sign yeah well so i give lectures on you know statistical reproducibility and yes you know, or irreproducibility and questionable research practices and so on and there are there are lessons that we've learned for example from my own field from the history of genetics from neuroimaging and so on. And the, the basic lesson is this. If you do small studies, that is studies with small numbers of people, and you're comparing, say, two groups of people with 20 people in them or 30 or 100, and you measure loads and loads of variables, uh, and, and you look for any of them that are different between the two groups, yeah. well, just by random noise, just because there's some variation within each group, you're going to get some that will will be outliers. Yeah. So just, you know, and, and if you only test those ones statistically, it looks like a significant difference. Yeah. Right? yeah. The problem is when you test loads and loads of variables, you can't just use the normal statistics. You have to correct for all the tests that you've done. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's like the difference between uh, being surprised that you won the lottery versus being surprised that someone won the lottery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. It's quite yeah. likely that someone will win the lottery because there's so many, you're playing so many tickets, right? If you only play one, 
uh, then you'd be surprised. And, and our statistics are there to tell us what we should be surprised by in our, in our data. But they can also be used they can also be used to fool ourselves, right? The whole point of them is that they help us not fool ourselves, but when you misuse them, um, it doesn't work. So what happens is, um, well, let me say, you know, a typical study, you take a, some number of people with autism, some people without, you compare the aspects of the microbiome, which is sampling thousands and thousands of bacterial species and all kinds of metabolites and so on. And then you find there's some that's different between them. And there's a bunch of studies that have been published like that. Um, and the question would be, okay, what do you make of those things? So th they're too small. They haven't done the stats right. If you do the stats right, there's actually no findings at all. Right? It's not just how should we interpret them. It's there's nothing there to pay attention to. And then if you look across studies, you know, you'll have, you could have multiple studies each claiming to have found something. And it looks like they're supporting each other because they both have microbiome and autism in the title and there's some association, right? But if you look at the details, it's like, well, it's not the same thing. They didn't find the same things. In fact, each of them, each of them fails to replicate the other one, right? So you get this whole field that kind of builds up that looks like there must be something going on, but it's all, as far as I can tell, and I mean, I've looked in detail, um, bullshit, I haven't seen any convincing thing whatsoever. And then eventually you'll get some really big study that's done. Uh, properly, and where the stats is done right, and so on, and usually then they don't they don't show anything, and that's exactly been done in the microbiome autism case, even though we still keep getting these other studies out. Right? So, um, and then the the other aspect of that is that you have publication bias, which yeah. is a really tricky thing to see. Where you know, say you do a test, these two groups, and and you find something. Uh, supposedly significant. Well, you're like, yay, I found something and you're going to publish it. But say you do the same test and you don't find anything, right? Yeah. Nothing comes up. What are you going to do with that? You're going to publish yeah, that? No, you're not. Yeah. yeah. No one's going to, no one wants to hear that. Yeah. Um, because actually, partly because they realize that the study is too small to make yeah. a conclusion one way or the other. So, so I have a huge problem just with the methodology. But then also, there's another problem after that, which is general to all epidemiology studies which is you find a correlation and then you assume causation. Well, you can't yeah. just assume it, right? And so, for example, within autism, many kids with autism have strange dietary preferences. Mm -hmm. right? they're, they're very rigid dietary preferences, unusual for, you know, atypical, right? And so there was one really big study that was done that found basically hardly any difference between the autistic children and non-autistic children in their microbiome, but the difference that they did find, very tiny, was attributable to dietary preference. So the arrow of causation was going the opposite direction. Gotcha. Yeah. So so for me, what really bothers me about this is the way these studies are presented, they're very hyped. They get tons of attention. Yeah. Um, the details of the methodology are not questioned properly. The inference of causation is not questioned properly. And then the effect size is also not mentioned, right, in the yeah. headline. It's yeah. just the microbiome is associated with autism. And then if you look at it, even if you take the data at face value, like the effect size is minuscule usually. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the follow-up is, and we can treat that with these probiotic yogurts that we have I, that this company yeah. that, that I happen to have a stake in sells. Yes. Uh, which, or the which, special which diet that is thousand dollars a week. Yeah. Uh, and these supplements, you know, we can or even to the level of you know fecal transplants and stuff like that. So there's a whole industry around that. Yeah. And it, it 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 um it leverages off the suspicion that uh, many people have about big pharma, right? Mm -hmm. It's like big pharma doesn't want you to hear this. Um, and what they may not realize is that big wellness, the supplement industry, yeah. is, that's like a $5 trillion industry. Globally. It's crazy at the moment. Yeah, it feels like everyone is selling supplements for some kind, doing something. And I did have that leisure on the list to go into supplements and kind of get your overall perspective on them. We'll, I, I, we'll get there in a bit. Um, so what do you think about probiotics specifically? What do they do? Are, do they do anything? Um are they overhyped? What does the research specifically say in relation to probiotics? Yeah, so I'm not, um, you know, I'm not 
an expert on probiotics, uh, it, from what I've seen and from people who, you know, doctors and dietitians and so on, um, talking about them for gut health, they, you know, I'm perfectly happy to, to accept that they have some, uh, important, uh, benefits. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, for mental health, I don't think there's any reason to think that they have any kind of direct benefits, except, you know, the, if your gut feels better, then maybe you'll feel better, right? Yeah, you know, that's fine. Yeah. Great, uh, no problem with that. Um, but the idea that it's going to cure depression or anxiety, uh, or certainly something like autism, which is not even a—it's not even a state that you're in that you could be out of. It's just the way a person is. Yes, yeah. The idea that someone's yeah. going to not be autistic, you know, based on some supplements, uh, is just a—it's just a weird premise in the first place, right? It's just yeah. a weird thing to think of never mind the fact that there's no evidence for it as far as i can tell yeah and are the connections that have made, been made between depression and the microbiome the same sort of studies that have been made between autism and the microbiome yeah, yeah. listen you and i could you, you and i could go right now we could do the joe rogan thing right we could go yeah. online we could search depression and microbiome and we could pull up the top cited 10 papers yeah and i guarantee you all of them would have those kind of methodological problems with them. okay and like yeah. i said there are things that we've learned painfully right through in other fields like we know now in genetics we know now in neuroimaging or some people do not to do these small studies or not yeah. to trust them, right and in fact in genetics for example when we moved from what was called a candidate gene association studies these small ones to genome-wide association studies where yeah. instead of testing a couple hundred people we test tens of thousands of people and we do the stats right and we report every association whether it's positive or negative um and then and and we replicate uh and so on right so the field really really tightened up the um methodology and now has the power to detect you know small subtle uh genetic associations um and and their collective effects and so on yeah and in doing that completely failed to to replicate any of this sort of candidate gene stuff right it's not yeah. just that it, and the reason i'm saying that is you know people might say okay well you, you don't know that it's wrong right just because you, you're not sure how whether to trust it or not some of the results must be right but yeah. actually the candidate gene literature really says no i mean there's no reason to trust them at all we yeah. just know these approaches generate false positives yeah 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 no that, that makes sense um so moving to two supplements because i'm kind of like they've just completely blown up in mm. i don't know in the last 10 years especially i think that every sort of influencer that has a bit of a health platform has partnered with some lab and is selling some sort of supplement or wellness thing yeah. um i'm curious to to go into new nootropics first Mm. Um, like first off, do, 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 have you have you looked into the research in, into nootropics? Are you uh, aware of them at all? Do you? No, I mean I haven't. And uh, yeah, no, you're you're getting well outside my domain okay, of expertise okay, okay. here. So, but I mean, I'll tell you just my general opinion, which isn't uh, scientifically informed in any detail. Okay. Um, which Thank is, you for saying that for the by the way, because if you yeah. were ninety nine percent of scientists, you would have said, yeah, yeah. Well, I actually I've, I read one article there about a week ago, so here's yeah. my full opinion, and here's my full. You know, so few people to go back to our previous point would have said what you just said, which is I'm yeah. not an expert. Well, they would have said something with confidence. Yeah. And then the, the listener and the viewer would have assumed all of your knowledge that we have talked about previously in the podcast and said, oh, now that they've said something about supplements, they're, they're probably an expert on this as well. You know, I'm going to check their going to check their link and see if they have an affiliate code for a particular nootropic because I'm this neuroscientist, neurogeneticist knew what they were talking about for all of the other. I mean, it's a halo effect, right? For yeah, all yeah, of yeah. the other things, they said this new conference, I'm going to believe them. So. We yeah. need more of that first off, but, but yes, please, please continue. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'll tell you what I would tell my, uh, my children who, yeah. who you know, they go, they're going to the gym, they're working out, they're thinking about taking this and that, you know, yeah. uh, generally I would say, just don't, you know, eat well, um, as you said earlier, sleep well, get your exercise. Um, if, if you have like a vitamin deficiency or something like that, you know, if there's some reason, some medical reason to take um, some particular supplements, then absolutely take them. You know, you might need folic acid, you might need vitamin D or vitamin B12 injections once every three months or something. Right? Of course, people do, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, without some particular 
evidence of a deficiency, um, you know, to my mind, there isn't a good reason to go looking for supplements. And I would take the, the possibility of bad effects as being um, higher than the possibility of benefits, because most of the time we're making most of the things we need perfectly well. Yeah. Um, like I said, unless you know that you're not, then, you know, that's my, but like I said, that's, that's a personal opinion. Yeah. Um, that's the way I try to um, approach things myself. And, you know, again, the question would be, you know, for listeners uh, who are listening to some podcasts, say, or, or and some scientists, and they're talking about a, a bunch of studies or whatever, and then they say, and oh, and by the way, here's these supplements, and, you know, I'm endorsing them and so on. Uh, you know, I think you you don't want to be cynical, uh, but a little bit critical. Got to uh, be skeptical. skeptical. If someone has a financial incentive, you have yeah. to. Skepti skepticism sort of has to be your first response to someone who's financially incentivized to sell you you yeah. know, a product like that. It just kind of yeah. has to be. Because and you have again, to the biases are. Yeah, I think that's right. And it, it, again, it plays on this, uh, the, the wellness idea, which has been very much promoted as like, you know, don't trust these big pharma stuff. Um, but here's some natural, natural things that you can take. Right? Yeah. That, that, um, so it's a weird, uh, people seem to sort of s suspend their critical faculties yeah. Uh, when they're hearing stuff that they're already inclined, it's in the it's in the air. It's the kind of um, ideas that they're um, inclined to believe. Yeah, and people, you know, people take advantage of that. I think because I always I always like to ask neuroscientists specifically if they take a particular type of you know cognitive enhancing drug, inverted commas, right? But like, because those are the kind of people you'd expect exactly expect to. If they coffee, sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm the same. But you, those are the kind of people that you would expect to do something if there was the right research in place. Because, you know, everyone want you want to be able to read research papers and, you know, um, focus better and be more attentive and then get like in bed more in your memory and then be able to conduct better research and to be able to teach better. As a, so you have all of the right incentives to want to have better cognition and to have better focus and attention, which yeah. is why I think and you'd be also in a great place to be able to read the literature on these things and if they actually work. So that's yeah. why I'm always curious on, it's not often the actual like neuroscientists that are proposing these things unless they sell them. Yeah. Um, it's your health influencer or your gym guy or anything. And yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, my view would be, well, yeah, just personally, I avoid all of that stuff except for coffee. Coffee, okay. Um, yeah, good. But also, I mean, it's interesting, you know, again, there was this, like, uh, you know, the, there was an idea that you slipped in there um, that gets slipped in, which is like, uh, say, remembering more stuff is better. Mm -hmm. Well, is it better? Like forgetting stuff is super useful. I mean, yeah. there's a there's a there's a um, there's a reason why our systems for remembering stuff and forgetting stuff are calibrated the way that they are. Mm -hmm. And it's just, yeah, th this idea that uh, it would be better to remember more stuff is just put out there without uh, examination, right? In yeah. the same way that the idea that your brain being more plastic uh, would be better. It's still like everyone, it's just like everyone just accepts that and yeah. then we go from there. But wait a minute, you, you have to ask, well, why would that be better? What's better about that? And you see the same thing, you know, in uh, discussions around psychedelics. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some measure of brain connectivity that increases or something like that. And, and people are like, look, Brain connectivity increased. Isn't that great? Why? Like the connectivity profile of our brain is the way it is for good reasons. Why do yeah. you think it's better uh, to have it be higher? It's just a there's a value laden thing that's slipped in. It's yeah. very subtle. Uh, but if you're not, you know, it, it bears examination. Yeah. Uh, I think those kinds of claims. Yeah, and it could be inhibitory connectivity that's enhanced. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that whatever is happening in your brain, more of is happening. It could be, oh. it could be less. So it's just, yeah, it, it, yeah. I completely, I completely support that. Let's move to something that you definitely are an expert on. Um, I've always been fascinated by synesthesia, and this yeah. is just a really, really cool brain phenomenon. Um, so first, like, what has your research into synesthesia led you to believe? Maybe give an overview, sort of, on what it is on a basic yeah. level first. And then sort of what your research on it has shown. And then I'd love to dive into other things like creativity and synesthesia. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Start there. Yeah, so you've so really fascinating research here. 
Yeah, it's an amazing um, condition. That's a, it's much more common than people think, maybe two, two to three percent of the population, where there's um, the word means a mixing of the senses. And mm -hmm. common kind of forms include things like seeing um, colors when you hear sounds or um, seeing, seeing like the letters of the alphabet with particular colors or associating them with colors, whether you see it out in the world or not is a, is a sort of a variable parameter in the experience, right? Yeah. Um, but there's loads of other forms like tasting words, um, like seeing, there's one called ticker tape synesthesia where you see the words that someone's saying, like a subtitles or, or, or falling out of their mouth or in your, in your I mind's have... eye, but like a, like the stock market ticker tape thing. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't heard of that one. That's fascinating. Yeah. Very, very, uh, interesting. And then there's, there's lots of other ones about, you know, touch and smell and, and, and so on. Um, What's, so it's super interesting for many, many reasons. One is just from a philosophical point of view. Like when you hear something and I hear something, there's always this question, are we, are we experiencing that in the same way? Yeah. And it's very, very difficult to prove that we are. Yeah. But in the case of synesthesia, you can really prove that we're not, right? Yeah. I mean, when, I, when you hear a little bell ring uh, and you see pink clouds flashing in front of your eye, that's a different experience, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so... Yeah, so I mean, there's other ones like uh, people who see auras around other people, like colored uh -huh. auras around other people, sort of depending on how they seems to be depending on how they feel about the the other wow, person. Wow, like a moral judgment on that person, almost. Well, I don't know if the moral or uh, some some emotional kind of um, relationship to them. That, that, that Again, I haven't heard this. So many different types. Yeah, there's lots and lots. And um, I mean, what's interesting for me as a developmental geneticist is this, it runs in families. Mm -hmm. It seems to be developmental in that the, most of the people who talk about it say that they've always experienced the world that way. Mm -hmm. So much so that, that many are unaware that anyone else doesn't experience the, the world that way. Yeah. Right? until they find themselves arguing about what color Wednesday is or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You, know. you mean so, words don't regurgitate out of your mouth whenever you, yeah. whenever you speak and that doesn't, um, yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we and many uh, people over the last uh, couple of decades maybe have been doing work on this. It was really popular actually in the late, late 1800s. Mm -hmm. uh, but then in psychology, psychology moved to its sort of behaviorist phase mm -hmm. um, when it was like only observable behaviors are scientific objects of study and subjective experiences were like just sort of thrown away um, because we couldn't trust that there was the argument we couldn't trust the subjective reports yeah um, but anyways in late sort of 19 I can't believe I just nearly said the late 1900s uh, <laughs> It's terrible. I did. Okay. So the, the, in the 1990s and the early 2000s, um, people started uh, looking at this again, started doing things like neuroimaging and, um, and some genetics and so on. We still don't really know. I think the neuroimaging, you know, the hope was that we could look inside the brain of somebody when they hear a sound and see their color area lighting up. It would have been a lovely, clean story, right? And we've done some neuroimaging. Other people have. Um, there isn't a clean story. It's... Um, it, it, it seems highly variable. Probably some of the studies, including the ones that we did, uh, fell foul of this problem of samples that were too small and looking at too many variables. I mean, obviously, you, know, you, know, you can do corrections for false discovery rate, but probably they're not completely valid. So um, it's got to be hard to recruit people for that study, right? I mean, like, well, like how do you yeah. even get? How do you even assume that they had, you're you're coming running into the same issue, which is to 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 be able to get twenty people that have the same synesthetic modality is incredibly hard. Because how do you even say the same synesthetic? Like, yeah, who's yeah. making that call? It's well, there's a lot. So there are some tools that we have that are psychophysical tools and um, like online platforms where people will go through and they'll choose the very very particularly what color their letters the are green. there's a five two one is that right where they're in different is five two where they're in different yeah, colors well, and people oh, those that... are little pop out pop out experiments yeah but the um okay. you can get it a sense so so people with genuine synesthesia have very very consistent associations over time and yeah. they'll they'll tend to spend some time picking out the very particular colors and then you can just ask them to do it again yeah um, and in fact we did a study um it was published a couple of years ago with two two people who had their synesthesia had been suppressed 
by either a series of head injuries uh, or a bunch of medications. So different medications can suppress this experience or indeed change it or enhance it. Interesting. Yeah, so we have another study looking at, at drug effects and interactions um, that's just about to come out. But um, interesting. The other one, what we found so was some people, one of the people had done this survey online where they had recorded their colors for various things. In this case, it was musical instruments and notes and so on. Um, and then after a period of, I think it was seven or eight years, could have been even longer, where they hadn't been, they hadn't experienced their synesthesia because of drugs and so on. Um, I mean, medications, they went, they off the medications, their synesthesia came back, they did the test again, and there was incredibly uh, robust, um, consistent sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about this is that it links to the idea of what perception really is, where it's not just sensation, it's recognition, right? So mm -hmm. we build... Uh, a mental kind of a map or model of the properties of various objects. So when we're learning an alphabet, you know, it's a bunch of squiggles at once. Uh, and the squiggles can come in slightly different forms, right? They're not always the same. When we see the letter A, it can be like this or like that. It can be a capital A or a small A. It yeah. can be, you know, different forms. But we have to we have to learn all that all of those things, all of those shapes correspond to this category, A, and the visual shapes correspond to this sound, A or a ah, or ah, or whatever, right? So we build up a kind of a schema that has visual components and auditory components. But while say children are doing that, if they happen to be synesthetic and they think, well, it also has a flavor, uh, they, can, they can incorporate that into the schema. So mm -hmm. now the, the concept of A has color and sound and flavor. Right? Or sorry, not color, has shape and, and, and sound, sometimes has color as well. Uh -huh. So, um, it, it gets it to this notion of the idea of perception being a skill where it's knowledge based. What we're doing is building up knowledge of things in the world and the properties that they have. Um, and synesthesia is just a window into that because sometimes there's like the brain is adding an extra property, uh -huh. it's actually not out in the world. It's internally generated, but it becomes very, very consistently part of the schema. Uh -huh that people have when they're thinking about the world. And so the 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 point I'm getting to is that um, synesthesia is just one example of many, many examples where differences in perception can lead to differences in the way that people think about the world. Yeah. And to me, that's just a really fascinating because I think it's very, very yeah. underappreciated how yeah. much diversity there is in the way that we um, approach the world, the way that we experience the world, the way that we think about it. Yeah. That leads into a very interesting point because the there's a lot of talk online about synesthesia and its correlation with creativity. Mm. So I'm curious if the research actually supports the fact that people that are able to have these different sensory modalities connected together in strange ways are more creative. And I, while I'm saying this, I know there's issues in saying more creative. It's a difficult thing to define. And yeah. um, I did a whole video on the neuroscience of creativity. And I just think this whole area is fascinating. And um, I know there's a lot of sort of people you can point to that are, say they're synesthetic and they're obviously very creative. That's a yes. bit of an anecdote, but yeah. I'm yeah. curious, like what does the research say in terms of synesthesia and creativity? Yeah, it's really mixed. As you said, there's lots of anecdotes. So there's lots of famous people, musicians, um, you know, from uh, Franz Liszt to Eddie Van Halen um, and, and many others who are, who are synesthetes and who say that their synesthesia in some way um, influenced their creative process yeah i don't know if that means it made them more creative i think it may have made them made their creativity manifest in a certain way or in, informed it in a certain way um it's very difficult to do you know that uh the kinds of studies that you would have to do you'd have to first of all have some definition of what's what's a creative person and then yeah. ask, ask you know get a bunch of synesthetes ask if they're more likely to be in a creative profession for example people have done that there's some studies that claim yes there's some studies that claim no there's lots of ascertainment problems when you're asking recruiting people to those kinds of things what's so an, ascertainment, I don't know, an ascertainment problem just a problem in recruiting candidates yeah what i mean is that the way that you're recruiting them yeah. may lead you to uh recruit certain types of people who are more likely to respond to gotcha. advertisements for example yeah. I mean, if yeah. for example you advertise a study synesthesia and creativity yeah yeah this number you know you're going to get musicians who see who yeah yeah 
we exactly. see color. So that's a, that's yeah. a big challenge. It's a big challenge in that area. I don't know what, um, yeah, I don't know what the final sort of word is. Um, it probably varies a lot depending on what you're calling creativity. Because you can think about creativity as being involved in the creative arts, for example. Right? Yeah. But you can also think about creative problem solving. I mean, many scientists are very, very creative thinkers. They yeah. can think beyond the, the the local sort of paradigm that they're in and, and, and think sort of laterally or outside the box. Um, whether synesthesia as a perceptual condition would have any kind of relevance to that type of creativity, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a very much an open question. Again, it's hard. It's very hard to, to define these terms and get a get a, a very a good study based on that because of that criterion. Yeah, exactly. The way I'm defining criteria, de defining uh, creativity is sort of the mix of this divergent and convergent process. So a mm -hmm. divergent process where lots of ideas are generated, where you're able to connect up different, you know, this memory with this taste, with this, you know, and just getting lots of ideas out there. And then the convergent process is bringing those ideas into something that, you know, an actual project, a, a video, a music, or, you know, it doesn't even have to be an outward thing. It's just refining of those outward ideas. Yeah. And it sort of is coherent that being a synesthetic, being having synesthesia would help with that divergent process but again i'm always suspect about coherent narratives because yeah. just because the fact that it's coherent doesn't mean that it's true so i was actually curious on what the evidence kind of stated on that yeah no it's yeah like i said it's open and, and what's interesting yeah. is that um when you're talking about a divergent process you can think it's divergent from somebody else's perspective in that it's an unusual association to make that you might not have made otherwise right um or that some other person might not have made and then we see that as creative um you know which in a sense it it is and that if that's your definition of something that's sort of unexpected um then i could certainly see you know some synesthetic links and associations being a, a vehicle to achieving that kind of thing so it's yeah it's perfectly reasonable um probably i guess what i would say is that i'm sure that some creative people use their synesthesia in fact i know that they do because i know several who do yeah. um, use their synesthesia in a way that really really informs their creative process yeah um yeah whether whether that licenses a more sweeping claim yeah. about synesthetes in general being more creative in general i'd be more um uh cautious about that kind of a claim yeah, yeah. Well, again, I do appreciate the caution and not in not making any sensationalist claims without any data. So again, I appreciate that. Is there any um, data that synesthesia ch warps or changes over time? And you said that it's it's consistent, but I have this memory of when I was a child and I was making value judgments about a video game. Obviously, this isn't how I thought about it when I was five. But you know, if I wanted to play one PlayStation Two game over another, I would assign it a a, a shape. And I, for some reason, always a triangle was the one that I wanted to play and a square was the one that I kind of wanted to play, but not right now. And then a circle was the one that I, you know, I was ascribing shapes to value judgments about games. Yeah. And I remember one of them, the reason I wanted to do a square was that I would be able to play that video game and tell my friends about it. And I was like, maybe that has to do with the corners and the square. I don't know. But I don't have that anymore. That's right. not a system I use for value judgments. I'm not making a decision in my life now and I say, well, that's a triangle and that's a square. Um, yeah. But I do have a distinct memory of making those sort of judgments that's, as a child. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's super interesting. So I haven't heard that kind of uh, thing before. It may just be like an idiosyncratic. Um, yeah, thing exactly. Kids yeah. do, right? I mean, kids think in weird ways. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's also true that many people report having had synesthesia as a child okay. and, and where it kind of goes away or it just becomes very latent or it's not a way that they actively think about things anymore. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a common experience. Okay. Um, it's, it, it led to the idea that all children are synesthetes, that all, you know, in, in children that their sensory pathways are kind of start out quite mixed up or talking to each other, and then they get pruned later on. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's lots of data to show that that's not the case. Not Actually, the case. it's not true that all children are synesthetes. Okay. Um, and, and it's not true that those sensory pathways are mixed up to begin with. They're actually very discreetly wired right from the get-go. I mean, gotcha. visual information goes here and it doesn't go there right from the get-go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that theory 
that we all start out synesthetes and some of us just retain it doesn't seem to um, be well supported. Makes sense. Another sort of coherent one that makes sense, um, yeah. but the data actually doesn't doesn't support it fully. Right. That's, why we, that's why we do the science. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, now I want to go to the other side because there is also cases of acquired synesthesia where people have got, people have been, you know, in blunt force accidents to the head. Um, I made a video on one one story that I could hardly believe where an orthopedic surgeon called Dr. Cesoria was hit by lightning and then started becoming a piano just genius. Yeah. Um, and I, I did, I like, I dove into it. I, the, this person definitely didn't play piano before the lightning and definitely did after. And they performed in front of audiences. And now you can be very suspect about different claims. Like he said, he heard piano, um, heard the piano in his sleep, and he was basically just downloading the music as he played it. You know, you can be suspect on all of those claims, but yeah. he did at least not play piano before the age of like 55, got hit by lightning, and then very, very quickly became a master at it beyond what experts said he should have been able to learn. Yeah. Is this just science that we don't really understand? Do you, like, do, uh, do you have any idea what's going on here? And there's a few of these. There's not uh, many acquired synesthesiates, but there, yeah. you know, there's a I few. Mean, I, wouldn't call, I wouldn't call that synesthesia in the first place unless he also had some synesthetic experiences while he was playing the piano, but it is so one I think of those. I think he had a lot of things connected to like musical modalities. Like there was just a lot of connections he was making in the physical world with musical he was hearing everything and you know there were there were a lot of different connections between music and where there wasn't before okay um yeah so i these cases are so rare right yeah. and like you said they're, they they can be quite anecdotal i yeah. always find it very hard to know what to make of them yeah and i resist i guess drawing any sort of firm general conclusions because i just don't think we know right we yeah. just don't know what's going on in that guy's brain yeah um we i mean there's you know there's other sorts of ones like foreign accent syndrome yeah where people wake up from a an injury and they're suddenly talking in a foreign do you believe their, that their own language in a foreign accent do you believe those uh, cases i don't know again i don't like i yeah. don't have any reason to doubt yeah that they're real except my sort of impression that that's a really weird thing to that's happen. crazy like it doesn't make uh, any sense yeah no i don't know i like i just have nothing they're the kind of thing I, when I see them, I don't know whether to doubt them or not. Um, yeah. I don't dismiss them. Yeah. I also don't know what to make of them. And so I just kind of shelve them, right? Yeah. You know, I, I'm aware of those cases. I kind of put them in the back of my mind and say, maybe at some stage that will become relevant information again, or we'll have new information that's relevant to that, that will help me make sense of it. But in the meantime, you, you think of it very much like a scientist. I think of it like a, a child because I get I get like a childlike joy and awe from that. I, when yeah. I hear a story like that, I'm like, wow, the brain is amazing. It's so interesting. I get like goosebumps on every bit of my body because I'm like, how crazy cool is that? Yes, right. we don't know anything about it. We can't make any assumptions on it. It really doesn't tell us anything about the brain other than we don't know anything about the brain. Yeah. But that in and of itself is a really interesting takeaway. There's sure. still stuff happening that is so beyond the realms of what we know that it, all we can do is it f let us fill it with fill us with excitement and intrigue and awe and say we need to keep learning. Yeah, yeah, and I so I absolutely have the same response, but I add a little extra bit, I guess, um, which is when I find something incredible, I take the meaning of the word incredible quite literally, right? Uh -huh. So at some point I go, wait a minute, incredible? That just means is incredible. You got right? you. Should yeah. not be believed. So where, you know, how, how am I going to calibrate my um, reaction to this kind of a story? Because you could hear a story like that, uh, that has, you know, turns out to have some good sort of uh, documentation behind it and so on. But you could also hear just an absolutely made up story that would sound yeah. something like that. And the question would be, how do you distinguish between them? Where do, where do you set your skepticometer uh, for those kinds of, uh, those kinds of claims? Yes, um, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. That, that's, that's the challenge. And the question is, can you do it in an informed way, right? Where you're saying, okay, I'm, I have this new piece of information and, you know, I could see it's somewhat consistent with things I know before, or it's completely inconsistent with yeah. them. And then it seems even more amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so crazy. cool, yeah. but, but it's far less likely to be true. So I would put like, you know, to come back to what we were talking about earlier, like the microbiome stuff. 
Yeah. You know, it's such a cool idea. It's like, oh, that's amazing. The the bacteria in your gut are are the cause of your depression. Yeah. Let me, let me write a New York Times article about that. And that's going to be cool. And people are going to read that. And they're going to talk yes. about it because it's such a cool idea. And it's radical, right? Yeah. Uh, but the more radical idea an idea is, the less likely it is to be true. Absolutely. I mean, that's just yeah. Where your Bayesian priors should be. Right? Yeah, absolutely. That's 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 why your your role in all of this is incredibly important. And um, because otherwise it would just be sensationalist stories all the time and people would be so interested in them and their clickbait titles, but we yeah. obviously obviously need to figure out what is credible in the incredibleness. Yeah. And you know the the challenge then again is is to try to replace the clickbaity um uh factoid sort of stuff with a more nuanced, complex, longer provisional story. Uh, you know, if I, you know, if we were to, to talk about the genetics of autism, mm -hmm. super complicated. Yeah. Um, there's all kinds of subtleties. There's all kinds of, you know, it's not just one thing. There's very different sorts of uh, genetic factors at play. Um, it would take ages, right? And and to communicate that to the general public, you'd have to explain, you know, what genes really are, yeah. uh, you know, how neural development really works, um, all of those really complicated things, right? Um, whereas I can just say the microbiome thing to you in a sentence, and you yeah, can get, exactly you can get the idea of it. Right? Yeah. So that's the challenge. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And it's a, it's a problem with scientific communication overall. And I would love to have you back sometime to dive into the genetics of autism because all of that is, is very interesting. I am, there's one more myth that I wanted to go to very quickly um, before, before we go on. I am, Andrew Huberman recently put up a, a large video related to growth mindset. Yes. And I saw you commented um, on one of his posts saying, you know, are we really doing this still? I'll put the, the tweet up on, on the screen that this is really supported by a lot of underpowered studies. And there's a lot of data that really sort of dispels the myth of growth mindset. Yeah. Um, talk about that a little bit. First off, what is growth mindset and what does the research say about yeah. it? Yeah. So, again, I'm not an expert, but I'm very aware that this uh, is research doesn't seem to be solid. So the growth mindset thing is, um, you know, proposed by um, psychologist Carol Dweck, I think is her name, um, among others. And it, it's making this very strong claim that a short intervention with children um, that tells them that they should think that they can grow, that they're not, that their skills are not fixed, that they can learn more, uh, and that the way that they're approaching things is not is not limited, but it's plastic. Um, can that 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 just that short intervention leads to better school results later on? Right? Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of small studies that claimed that, um, and then there were a bunch of other studies that didn't quite claim it or didn't replicate it. And then the you know Carol Dweck and others were saying, well, you're just not doing it right. You have to intervene like this, right? It's exactly like this. You have to do it. And then there was all this back and forth, and but it was all part of the kind of. Um, the replication crisis that hits psychology first, probably, especially social psychology, where there were lots of things like this, you know, what is it? it's growth mindset or power posing or, or whatever it is. Yeah. The idea we talked a little bit earlier, where, you know, some brief intervention, the, the mind training things are the same, right? So brief intervention here makes some huge difference to your life, right? Um, or at least some measurable, useful, measurable outcome, right? Now, I'm all for telling kids, that they can do better, that they can learn better. Yeah, that important learn. distinction. We shouldn't do the yeah. opposite to, to, to children. <laughs> right, exactly. So just encouraging them to learn and, and saying, yeah, you know, uh, th this is um, part of the process of being frustrated or, or, you know, failing is that you're learning how to do this and so on. You know, that's all great. It's all part of traditional educational theory. Yeah. Uh, but the really, really big studies have just uh, failed to replicate any sort of these the, the, what I call the magic effects, right? The ones that are really incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's just unbelievable, right? That that short of an intervention would have this big effect, you know, on somebody's life. Um, and again, I guess the idea of, well, what happens in the next 10 minutes or the next hour uh, or the, you know, the two weeks after you do the, the, the growth mindset thing every day for two weeks or whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's inherently, to me, uh, kind of just uh, unlikely. And then the data, we know the methodology that we're 
that, that showed the positive effects were from small studies and not well corrected and so on. And then the methodology from big studies and meta analyses that's better done shows no effect. So, you know, my conclusion is there's no effect. Yeah. Um, and yet we keep hearing about it. And of yeah. course, the thing is, like, I don't mind like telling people, uh, you know, talk like this to your kids. It's great. But usually, and I don't know if this was the case in in the video that Andrew um, Huberman posted there, uh, but oftentimes the the growth mindset TM, right, that comes with a price tag. It's yeah. like that's the program you pay for. Right? Yeah, those are the books. Those are million dot. I mean, those are best selling books, right? Based yeah. on uh, on those kinds of paradigms. And online so, work. Yeah, yeah. So there's a um, again, you know, someone's making money. Someone's making money out of these claims. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, yeah, it, it gets my goat a little bit. I gotta say, yeah. no, um, it, especially uh, when somebody's making money is when it really, what really irks me as well. But yeah. I guess as a general consensus, probably harmless unless you're spending money on it and yeah. probably harmless unless you're doing it in replacement of action. You know, you're sitting at home and you're do you're employing some growth mindset protocol that doesn't involve actually doing anything. Yeah. You know, like the the left hand toothbrushing sort of stuff where you're 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 not actually engaging in a thing that will change your brain. You're just engaging in some vitamin protocol that you're hoping yeah. will have a huge effect. And that's just not how the brain is wired. It wouldn't be yeah. useful for the brain to be wired that way. And it's important yeah. that it's not. And it's, yeah, it's exactly. not good to have that mindset either that you can so easily change your brain. Yeah. And, you know, what would be good would be to say to students and, you know, sports coaches use this all the time is like, you know, visualize what success will look like and the work that you need to do. I mean, you're training for a triathlon, right? <laughs> you know what it takes yeah. to do that consistently through time. And the same thing is true for, you know, academic study. And you know, yeah. too, having been through it, what it takes to do that, that it's sustained effort through time, but also believing that you can get there. Of course, that's yeah. really important. Um, but just saying to somebody, yeah, you can do it. Uh, and then thinking that they can sit back and wait for this magic to happen that's the yeah. that's the danger i think is that exactly and and it's it's the mindset of 2024 unfortunately it's the mindset of the tiktok era that i call it which is that we can have miracle cures in 60 seconds put out little, little short fixes yeah. yeah yeah exactly but i think that's that's an amazing message to finish this on this has been an amazing conversation and so much fun thank you so much for taking the time yeah, um, i really recommend that everyone should go and read your book free agents um for people who don't understand evolution as well, a lot of people can get tangled in the free will argument. And I honestly stayed out of it for a while because there's so much nomenclature, so many words, yeah. and it can be philosophical. Even if you're not innate, inherently interested in free will and you're interested in evolution, I think it's a brilliant book because I think the you know using the evolutionary lens as a, as a framework for it, I think is fascinating. So I really recommend the book. Um, I will leave all your, your, your Twitter links um, below because I think your Twitter feed is amazing for learning about neuroscience cool. um, and any other links that, uh, that you might have. But um, yeah, thank you so much. I think you're an incredibly important scientific communicator um, in 2024, sure. an important one that's dispelling myths in an era where misinformation just seems to be everywhere. And I hope you uh, keep on doing your job because it's, uh, it's amazing and it's appreciated. It's having an impact. Great. Well, I, I really, I really appreciate that. It is, it is nice to hear. Sometimes it sounds like it feels like shouting into the, yeah. into the void. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I really appreciate that, and uh, it's very nice to see you again. Yes. And I hope everything's, hope everything goes well, and uh, yeah, good luck with the triathlon. Thank you so much.